So good morning. Um, okay, the walk up the hill gets harder and harder every day, but hopefully the material gets more and more interesting. So these are supposed to compensate each other. Uh, today, I'd like to take a little pause from the more practical aspects of collider physics and talk about a theoretical topic that I brought up in the first lecture and told you I would postpone to this lecture. And that's the following question. You remember in the first lecture I was writing down all of these polarization vectors for spinners and for spin one particles. And one of the things we encountered was that for a boosted vector boson with um, E00P, there were three polarization vectors. The two transverse vectors, which have a perfectly standard form, and the longitudinal polarization vector, which when we computed it, we, what we found was this. So we found a vector whose components are increasing without bound as the vector boson, let's say the W boson, is boosted. Um, if I take the limit as uh, E goes to infinity, it becomes parallel to the momentum vector, P mu over MW. But at the same time, you can see that because of the funny features of Lorentz geometry, this vector is always orthogonal to that one, even though they're parallel. Now, the fact that these components are extremely large can lead in some circumstances to answers for amplitudes that are extremely large. And let me just give you a simple example, which I'll come back to and clean up later in the lecture. Let's consider E plus E minus annihilation through a virtual photon, let's say, to a pair of W bosons. So I'll write down the detailed form of the vertex for this process a little later, but I think you can imagine at least this vertex must have a piece of the following form. Um, it has to have something like a scalar, the coupling to a scalar, the same coupling that we would have in E plus E minus to gamma star to some scalars, which is uh, K minus minus K plus mu. And then we have to do something with the W polarization vectors, so the natural thing to do is to dot them into each other. And then we get an expression for the vertex that looks like this. Now, this W is going one way, and this W is going the other way. So if I use those polarization vectors to evaluate this quantity, what I get is P squared over M squared plus E squared over M squared. And in the limit of high energy, this is going to uh, 2 e squared over m squared, that is to say s over 2 mw squared. Well, that's pretty strange. That says that the cross-section for um, e plus e minus to w plus w minus is enhanced over the corresponding cross-section for a scalar by a factor of s over 2mw squared. And this just seems out of bounds. Actually, you can make it more rigorous. Um, everything here is happening in the s wave. So this prediction also, uh, this satisfies unitarity. And when you multiply by s, it violates unitarity. So there's actually some kind of theoretical difficulty here that we would like to solve. But the first thing I'd like to do is to ask, um, Okay, we got some answer here, which is extremely large for situations where very energetic W bosons are produced. Is this real or is this fictitious? Um, does it survive or does it somehow get canceled when we evaluate everything correctly? And so that's the question that I'd like to take up in this lecture. And I hope you understand that this is a very important question because as you saw from the previous lecture, all over LHC physics,
we have emission of, ma of very energetic W and Z bosons. If their longitudinal polarization states are produced, as they are in many cases, this kind of question is always going to arise. And so we should try and get some understanding of it. So, well, so the question you can ask then is, if you find a large enhancement like this, should you take it seriously or not? Is it really there or is it somehow not really there? And the answer, oddly, is it depends. Um, in different kinds of processes, it might be there or it might not be. And I'm going to give you an example of one of each type in the course of this lecture. But it turns out that there's a principle that you can use in order to figure out whether the enhancement should be there or not. And the principle is very easy to explain. It's a little tricky to prove in generality, and I'm not going to do that in this lecture. Um, there's a very nice reference I'll give you in a moment. So let's think again about um, how Ws acquire mass. We start out with the massless W boson, so massless SU2 Young-Mills theory. Massless SU2 Young-Mills theory has two degrees of freedom, namely the W is moving at the speed of light, and it has left-handed or right-handed polarization. If you quantize, let's say, in Feynman gauge, you also have two more polarization states, time-like and longitudinal. And you know from the example of quantum electrodynamics, those two examples are totally unphysical. Um, in quantum electrodynamics, in Feynman gauge, the emissions of those uh, modes always cancel each other. Actually, you remember the time-like polarization of a vector field has creation and annihilation operators that look like this. And then there's a negative sign out here. Which comes from just the fact that what stands here is minus g mu nu, if there are mu and nu here. So the time-like polarization is always a negative metric degree of freedom which means it counts as negative probability. And so in a covariant gauge, what happens is that the time-like emissions and the longitudinal emissions cancel each other, one with positive and one with negative probability. It's weird. If you go to a physical gauge like Coulomb gauge, both of those degrees of freedom just don't exist. And all you have left are the left and right-handed species. When you now go to a massive SU2 Young-Mills theory, you do that by breaking the symmetry. In fact, the only way we know how to do that consistently with the principles of Lorentz invariance and causality is to have a spontaneously broken gauge theory. Then what happens is that there's another degree of freedom that gets involved, which is the Goldstone boson corresponding to the symmetry breaking. So, for example, in the standard model, what breaks the symmetry is the Higgs field. Sorry, V plus H plus I pi zero. So, um, in particular for the W boson, this guy and its conjugate are the Goldstone bosons that are created when you spontaneously break the symmetry. Um, naively, they would have uh, zero mass. When you quantize in Feynman gauge, it turns out they get the mass of the W that mass depends, it's a fictitious quantity, it depends on what gauge you're working in. And so what happens is that this guy adds to the uh, time-like and longitudinal polarizations and everything cancels and in the end you get one extra degree of freedom which you can think of as being supplied by this Goldstone boson. So now um, at rest what you get in massive SU2 Young-Mills theory is a boson which, when it's at rest, has three equivalent polarization states. They're, they're totally equivalent. They're related by rotations. And there's no distinction between one and the other. But you might hope that the different origin of the various states gets revealed when you have a state which is highly boosted. So if I now think about a, if I think about a W boson at rest, there's no difference between the three polarization states. But if I have a W boson which is highly boosted, 
then you would think that the left-handed state, maybe a, yeah, the right-handed state here, would very much resemble in its couplings the original massless uh, W boson of the unbroken SU2 theory. Similarly, the left-handed polarization state would resemble in its couplings the massless W boson of the unbroken theory. And what's left over is the longitudinal state. And the intuition would be that its couplings would be related to the couplings of the Goldstone boson that got eaten when the W boson acquired mass. And actually, it's possible to actually prove this as a theorem. So there's a theorem called the Goldstone boson equivalence theorem. which was first enunciated by Cornwall and Tiktopoulos and by Vianakis. And um, it, it went through various stages of refinement in its proof. I think the nicest proof you'll find in a paper of Mary Kay Gaillard and Chanowitz for which you'll find the reference in the notes. So these people prove the theorem in uh, more or less complete generality, uh, allowing not only one high energy W boson in the amplitude, but really as many as you like. And what the theorem says, I'll quote one W boson, is, is that if you have A going to B plus a W boson of energy E, that as E gets large, that amplitude becomes the amplitude for um, computed in Feynman gauge, let's say, the emission of the Goldstone boson up to corrections that are of order MW over E. So when the W boson is near rest, these corrections are large, but when the W boson is highly energetic, then you can think of the emission of the W boson in terms of the emission of the Goldstone boson that that W boson ate to become massive. So this is a very general result, but now what we'll see is that it has different consequences depending on what process you apply it to. And so let's now consider some examples of this. So the first one that I'd like to talk about is top quark decay. So I talked a little about top quark decay yesterday because we introduced uh, top quark production as one of the important processes that we wanted to understand at the LHC. And so yesterday we uh, reviewed that the top quark decays to an on-shell W boson the only uh, sizable CKM angle the top quark has is the one that links it to the bottom quark. And so almost all top quark decays, all but like a percent of top quark decays, um, are, have the bottom quark in the final state. Um, it's a weak interaction, so this is always a left-handed bottom quark. And it's a very good approximation to ignore the bottom quark mass. And I'm going to do that to simplify this discussion. So unlike most weak interactions, this is a simple uh, two-body decay process with both particles on shell. So we can really think in detail about its kinematics. And what I'd like to do is to compute the decay amplitudes for this process and try and understand their kinematics in a very clear way. Now, the W boson can be in several polarization states, uh, right, zero, or left. And I, you remember I told you in the first lecture that we can actually experimentally determine what the polarization state of the W is by reconstructing the W and looking at its decays. So last time I, so in the first lecture I drew you this diagram. So now we have a W plus, which is going to a right-handed lepton and the neutrino. So if I put the W in its rest frame, I, um, this is the direction from which the W came out of the top quark. This is the angle 
to the lepton, let cosine theta be that angle, then a right-handed w has a 1 plus cosine theta squared distribution, a left-handed w has a 1 minus cosine theta squared distribution, and a longitudinal w has a central distribution. So if I can actually reconstruct the w and measure this angle in an event, that gives me some idea of what the polarization of the w was. Okay, so let's keep track of those things and start computing these decay amplitudes. So the Lagrangian, the matrix element rather, is I g over root 2. The left-handed, um, let, let me use these same uh, symbols that I was using in the previous lecture. So this is the top, the bottom, and the W. Uh, UL of K, sigma dot epsilon star of Q, UL of P. The top quark I'm going to take to be at rest. So the spinner, the four component spinner for the top quark looks like this, where C describes the spin direction of the top quark. And the, I think the easiest coordinate system to do this in is the one in which the um, W boson goes along the three axis. The bottom quark is going on the negative three axis and the top quark spin is in some direction with respect to this, which I'm going to call that angle theta. So the UL of P is the top components of this, and the spin direction theta is described by writing uh, cosine theta over 2 minus sine theta over 2. The left-handed bottom quark spinner is the one that I wrote for you in the first lecture with the bottom quark going in the negative 3 direction. So this is the square root of 2k times minus 1, 0. And the three W polarization vectors are the ones that I wrote in the first lecture. So um, here we go. Epsilon of q is 1 over root 2 one um, epsilon star of q minus i zero for right-handed, for left-handed, and that the one we're we're especially concerned with now, this one, for a longitudinal polarization vector. Okay, well now we're all set up. We can just compute this amplitude. It's really not very hard, and so let's do the various cases. Let's start out with W R B left. So then we get R over the square root of 2, the square root of M, the um, B spinner here, product sigma dot epsilon. This vector here is actually going to give you a 2 corner. and then the top quark spinner, cosine theta over 2 or whatever over here. Well, you can see that that times that is 0, so we just get 0. And actually, it's not hard to understand why this is 0. If you think about the kinematics I've set up here, the right-handed W is carrying a spin like that. The left-handed bottom quark is carrying a spin like this. So the total system has spin three halves. So if the top quark has spin a half, the decay to that particular channel is totally forbidden. It turns out that at the next order in QCD corrections, you can emit a gluon and a right-handed W. Um, but that effect turns out to be just numerically extremely small. It's at the 10 to the minus 3 level or something. Okay, now what about T to W left, B left? Well, it's the same expression. Sorry, there's a square root of 2KM that I've left out up here. 1 over root 2, except that the 2 is now up in this corner. So um, that times that times that is going to give us something like um, Km 
Ooh. G over, let me just remember whether these things cancel or not. Yeah, there's a square root of 2km left over. This, that, and that all cancel, and you have cosine theta over 2. And I think I didn't leave anything out. Oh, sorry, it comes from the lower term, sine theta over 2. Maybe a factor of minus i. So if I wrote this, rotate this back into the normal situation where the top quark spin is here, um, the W tends to go backwards in the top quark rest frame, and the bottom quark uh, goes forward. Uh, the W carries a spin this way, the bottom quark carries a spin, sorry, the W carries a spin this way, the bottom quark carries a spin this way, one minus a half is a half in the right direction. So you can actually guess the uh, angular dependence from the spinology, as we've just worked out. Okay, and then there's just one more case, which is the case where the, um, W is longitudinally polarized. So for that case, we get the square root of 2km ig over root 2, um, this same vector. Now um, I get here uh, p plus e over m, p minus e over m, using this polarization vector, uh, cosine theta over 2, sine theta over 2. So now what you see is we get the opposite spinology. Um, the W boson is now forward instead of backward in the, with respect to the top quark spin direction. And then there's this factor of P plus E is actually M top. So we get a factor of M top over MW. Well, this is actually pretty interesting because this also illustrates the point that I made at the very beginning of the lecture. The, um, these factors of P and E over MW come from the large components of the longitudinal polarization vector. And the fact that the final result ends up with an M top over MW, M top is the order of magnitude of the momentum of the W boson in a top decay. And so there's actually definitely an enhancement in this cross-section and, um, well, I mean, there's not much to this calculation. There, there's nothing that cancels this effect. It's a real effect. So let's just gather up the formulae and try and get the, uh, the, the final results for top decay. So the width of the power arc is then 1 over 2 mt, 1 over 8 pi. Um, the average value of this angular dependence or sine squared theta over 2, which is a half. There's a 2km. There is a, um, from that expression over there, a g squared. Um, and that's it, 1 plus mt squared over there's an extra 2 here, 2 mw squared. And then there's phase space, which is another 1 minus mw squared over mt squared. And let me remind you that for a decay like this, k is equal to mt squared minus mw squared over 2 mt. That's simple kinematics. In the end, we get the following formula. Um, the width of the top quark is um, g squared over 4 pi is alpha w mt. But there's some more mt's here. So actually, it's mt cubed over mw squared. Um, there's a 16 that appears here. And there's a um, 1 plus 2 mw squared over mt squared from this expression here, and then there are two factors of mw squared over mt squared. 
And I think I got that right. Let me just check the notes again. Yeah, we're doing great. Okay. So this is, again, something unexpected. I mean, normally when you have a weak interaction decay, you get an alpha W, and that's about all you get. So you get a width, which is alpha W times M top. But it turns out this isn't the right answer. The right answer is that you get that enhanced by the factor of MW squared over M top squared that comes from the square of this uh, longitudinal polarization amplitude. Um, the total, the actual value of this thing is about 2 GeV, so the top quark is quite a wide object for something that has a weak decay. Okay, um, another way of an understanding where this enhancement comes from, I did this all in uh, helicity eigenstates, but we could as well just sum over W polarizations with the amplitude, like use a normal method for Feynman diagrams. If you do that, you encounter the polarization sum. And for a massive vector boson, this sum I think as I discussed in the first lecture, has to equal something like this. And in quantum electrodynamics, uh, Q mu dotted into an amplitude is zero, so you always forget about this term. But in a spontaneously broken weak interaction theory, you can't forget about this term. This term is of order Q is of order M top, so it's of order M top squared over MW squared, and actually it gives the dominant contribution to the amplitude. So you just have to be careful when you use polarization sums to compute things that involve very energetic W bosons or Z bosons. Okay, now how can we understand why this answer is what it is? Well, let's go back and try and use the intuition that we got from the relation between energetic longitudinal W bosons and the Goldstone bosons that combined with the W when the W got mass. So let's imagine trying to compute now the right-hand side of the Goldstone boson equivalence theorem, which would be T to pi plus B, where pi plus is a particle that came from the Higgs field. So the Lagrangian that we want to use is the Yukawa interaction, um, Q bar left dot phi uh, T right plus Hermitian conjugate. So this is the Yukawa interaction between the top quark and the Higgs field. If I just get a vertex from this, it has the following form. The top quark Yukawa coupling, the um, Bottom quark spinner is in here. This is a TB, so UL of K. In here, we have, as I wrote for you before, the top component is the pi plus field. Um, this component here is going to give the top quark mass. So we just have one, and then from here we have but now the right-handed part of the top quark spinner, which if the top quark is at rest, looks exactly the same as the left-handed part of the top quark spinner. And then you can just write this out. Um, the square root of 2km minus 1, 0. This thing is the square root of m times what I wrote before, cosine theta over 2, sine theta over 2. And what you see is we get a very similar form. The angular dependence is the same. It's cosine theta over 2. There's a Yukawa coupling now and a square root of 2m, 2km. Now, so that structurally looks very similar to this. In fact, it's not hard to show that it's totally identical. <laughs> because let's look at all the factors that are in this expression. There's a g over the square root of 2 and mt over mw. So the top quark mass is yt 
divided by the square root of 2 times V, the Higgs vacuum expectation value. The W mass is GV over 2. Everything cancels. Ooh. Oh, sorry. That and that add and cancel this. The G's cancel. And the only thing left is YT, which is the overall coefficient in this expression. So it works out exactly right. The emission of a Goldstone boson in the top decay totally explains the size of the amplitude for emitting a longitudinally polarized W boson. And actually, it even explains why that amplitude is larger than you would have expected. The transverse W bosons couple with the strength of G. So that's a strength in the gauge boson sector. Um, let me remind you that G squared over 4 pi, which is alpha weak, is something like 1 over 30. Now, Y T squared over 4 pi, the top quark Yukawa coupling, is something like 1 over 17. And so the Higgs sector coupling to the top quark is just stronger than the Higgs sector couple than the gauge sector coupling to the top quark. And what the components of the polarization vector are doing is turning the gauge sector coupling strength into a Higgs sector coupling strength. So it's an interesting effect, and it's one which in many other contexts, when you emit a W boson, you can actually take advantage of this to claim that there's a very large cross section which is more easily measurable. By the way, this is all theory, but you can ask whether there's any experimental support for what I've just explained to you. But actually, um, it's not hard to see how you would do the experiment. We've made a prediction for the polarization of W bosons in top decay, and you can go reconstruct top decay events and see whether the prediction is correct. In particular, what we've argued is that the probability of finding a longitudinally polarized W is mt squared over mw squared over mt squared over mw squared plus 2, which if you put in the numbers is about 70%. If you think about the W decay distribution that I talked about a little earlier in terms of the angle cosine theta, then the right-handed component I've explained to you is zero, the left-handed component is small, and the longitudinal component is dominant. So what you expect is a dependence on cosine theta that looks something like this. And then, um, if we pick up top quark events at the LHC, or actually this was already done at the Tevatron, one can go try to measure this shape. So, let's think about how you would do that. You probably want a leptonic W decay, so that you know forward from backward on this diagram. If you think about TT bar, to, let's say, lepton neutrino, B, the other W going to QQ bar, B bar, uh, what you're looking for is a lepton plus 4 jet event with, um, depending on how rigorously you want to make the selection, either one or two B tag jets. The jets which are not B tag, two of them should combine to the mass of the W. And if you look for events like that, you can then constrain the W masses to be the W mass and the top quark masses to be the top quark mass and fully reconstruct the event. It gives you enough parameters that you can determine the momentum of the neutrino. And so now you can measure this distribution. And in figures one and two of the slides, what I show you are the measurements done um, about a decade ago at the Tevatron, and then very recently at the LHC. Here's the, the plot here is from Atlas. Now, you have to interpret these plots with a little grain of salt because they're, um, when the lepton is at low energy, which is basically on this side of the curve, the efficiency for finding the lepton is lower. Um, you don't precisely measure the kinematics, so instead of getting a zero here, it kind of sloughs over a little. 
but especially in the atlas plot, you can see that the shape is more or less exactly what's predicted here. And if you include the simulation of the detector effects, that's actually the curve which is shown in um, blue dots on this figure. And you see that it's an excellent fit to the data. So theoretically, the enhancement in the process of top decay is supposed to be there. Um, we, it's, the computation is quite unambiguous and there's nothing around that cancels it. And experimentally, um, we see exactly the prediction that the probability of a longitudinal W in top decay is close to this number 70% that this simple calculation predicts. So, so far so good. We, we're understanding this enhancement in a very clear way. Okay, so now we go back to the process that I started with in this lecture, which is E plus E minus to W plus W minus. So there I argued that there was an enhancement which actually had the form that it continued to grow as the center of mass energy increased. We found an enhancement like S over MW squared. And what I'd like to ask is in this process, is that enhancement there or is it just fictitious? So let's get a little more serious about computing this amplitude. A couple important things that I left out of my earlier discussion. Probably the most important one is that at high energy, I'd better take into account gamma Z interference. And so let me try and write down the expression for the sum of these two diagrams uh, with gamma Z interference going to W plus W minus. And let's do the computation first for a right-handed electron annihilating a left-handed positron. So the right electron only couples to the um, gamma and Z. It doesn't couple to any W thing or whatever that would be in the state. So this is a somewhat easier computation to do. So let me carefully work out couplings according to the standard model and write down the result for this amplitude. It's IM times IE. Right-handed coupling gives me 2 times P, the momentum of the electron. So that's the U bar sigma U that we saw before. Then the structure of the vertex is a little more complicated than I made out at the beginning of the lecture. The term that I had indicated is this, and there are two more terms, U times minus Q minus K minus times epsilon plus, and epsilon plus mu uh, Q plus K plus dotted into epsilon minus. So that's the Young-Mills vertex. And actually the Young-Mills vertex has the same structure in these two uh, places. And then the photon Z interference is manifested in the following way. Um, it's the electromagnetic coupling in both places for the photon. And then for the Z, um, it's a right-handed electron, so there's a minus SW squared over CW SW here. And then the value of this coupling has an extra factor of CW over SW. So when you go through carefully and get all the factors right, what you find is this expression. Now, this expression, um, as you see, has a surprise. which is that when you cancel everything here, what you find asymptotically in S is the photon contribution times a minus sign. So in the end, this factor here asymptotically would be just M 
z squared over s times s minus mz squared. In particular, there's an extra factor of 1 over s that cancels the factor of s over 2mw squared that we previously found in that expression. So let me just kind of work out the details of this. To make it easy, let's go to the asymptotic limit. So epsilon minus the longitudinal polarization vector. I'm always only computing this for longitudinal bosons. Would be like k minus over mw. Epsilon plus is k plus over mw. So the thing in the brackets, I need some quantities like epsilon plus dot k minus plus q. So that's um, k minus over mw times 2k, sorry, k plus over mw times 2k minus, which is s over mw squared s over mw. And similarly here, epsilon minus times k plus plus q is going to be the same thing, k minus over mw, 2k plus, which is s over mw. And so very nicely, what you get are um, Very nicely, uh, uh, sorry, and this is k minus, and this is going to be proportional to k plus. So what you get is basically minus twice what we got over here. And the final result looks something like this. Um, minus i e squared, the um, spinner product, just as we had before. There's a k minus minus k plus that factors out of the expression. There's a cancellation between these terms and the one I computed before, which leads to an overall s over 2 mw. Um, there is then uh, mw squared. There is then this term, which is mz squared, or maybe I should have written minus mz squared, divided by s squared. And um, that's the whole expression. And when you're done, what you get is minus i e squared 2 root 2 p epsilon r of p dotted into k minus k plus and there's a 1 over s, and everything else here cancels except the 1 half, and let's remember that mw squared in the standard model is cosine squared theta w times mz squared, the 1 over cosine squared theta w left over. Okay, so there's a little effort that's involved in getting to this point, but you can check that I got it right. And now um, we can look at the interpretation of this quantity, which actually is pretty cool. Uh, 1 over CW squared is the coupling, E squared over CW squared is the coupling in the unbroken SU2 theory, unbroken SU2 cross U1 theory, to the U1 gauge boson. So this answer here is exactly what we would get for the following process. Pi minus pi plus the Goldstone bosons, created by a B vector boson, the U1 vector boson, coupling then to a right-handed electron and a left-handed positron. This coupling here is E over CW. This coupling here is E over 2 minus 2 CW. So the overall factor in this expression works out just exactly right. And here you see the right-handed current coupling to the current of a scalar field. Wow. So um, it's, a, it's a calculation, but when the smoke clears, what we get is an answer that perfectly vindicates the um, 
Goldstein boson equivalence there. Okay, now the calculation is a little harder for the left-handed electron initial state. Um, I'm just going to sketch it here, and actually, uh, you really have to work a lot harder to get the final answer, but let me tell you how it goes. So if I have a left-handed electron initial state, then this becomes left, that's a rather trivial change. The thing that doesn't, that is a non-trivial change is that this factor here becomes the left-handed coupling to the Z boson, which is a half minus SW squared. And so there's a term here then that doesn't cancel, namely this term, which is specific to the left-handed electron. And so let me try and write down that contribution as best I can. The analysis here is the same, so I'm going to get k minus minus k plus dotted into that vector. I get the same minus s over 2mw squared. And then left over is this term here, which is a half. Um, and asymptotically, it's a 1 over s. So, oh, sorry. Um, the, this cancellation occurs. This doesn't cancel. So it's a uh, 1 over SW squared times S. Okay. And um, let's see. So this goes like S. That goes like S. This goes like 1 over S. And so there's still a factor of S enhancement. And maybe I should say also um, the amplitude grows sufficiently fast that it violates unitarity in the S channel. So there's still a problem here that we have to solve. <laughs> However, for the left-handed electron, there's one more diagram that I've omitted, which is the diagram where the left-handed electron couples to a W boson in the neutrino which then can emit a W plus and turn into a right-handed positron. So we have one more chance to see that everything cancels. The value of this diagram is IM is equal to IG over root 2 squared um, V right sigma dot, uh, let me write it down here, V right sigma dot epsilon uh, plus i, um, the momentum that goes this way, let's call this um, p, I called this k minus. So this is p minus k minus dot sigma over p minus k minus squared sigma bar dot epsilon minus and u uh, l of So this looks like it has totally the different structure. It looks like it has a T-channel singularity, whereas all the diagrams over here have an S-channel singularity. However, in the limit of very high energy, this guy here becomes K minus over M, which acting on the U is the M because sigma dot p annihilates u. Well, now that times that cancels the denominator, and this amplitude is dramatically simplifying. So I m is now um, i, g squared is e squared over s w squared. Um, there's a 2 that comes from here. There's a v right there is a sigma dot epsilon minus, 
Um, that times that over that just cancels and gives minus 1. And there's a 1 over mw squared. And 1 over mw. And in here, there's a k minus over mw, which we can write as um, k minus minus k plus plus k minus plus k plus over 2. This is equal to p plus p bar, and it annihilates on the two spinners, and this is just what we want. So, v right sigma bar dot k minus k plus u left, it's exactly the same structure as what we have here. The, um, there's two 1 over mw squareds. Please notice that um, there are no s's here. So that's exactly in agreement with what's in this expression. Um, there's another factor of a half which actually we have um, a factor of a half here and a factor of a half here. And if I were really clever and it were afternoon, I could probably even get the minus sign right for you. But it's correct in the notes. So let, let, me, let me not embarrass myself by trying to do that. <laughs> but you see, the structures are exactly the same. And they're exactly set up so that when you add this diagram in, it, it um, kind of miraculously cancels the answer from these diagrams and gives you an amplitude which is consistent with unitarity. Now, the approximation that the polarization vector is equal to k over m is a little crude to really get the final answer. Um, you have to actually put in the correct value of the polarization vector to get the next term in the series beyond the one that cancels. But I encourage you to actually do that exercise. And when you do the exercise, you will find the following very beautiful result. That the matrix element turns out to be equal to uh, minus i e squared p epsilon l dot k minus minus k plus times um, minus i over 2 sw squared plus minus i over 2 cw squared, which is to say it turns out to be exactly the contribution of the two diagrams that you find in the unbroken SU2 limit, where you have the left-handed electron coupling to the SU2 of the amplitude and also coupling to the U1 part of the amplitude. Okay. So, um, well, what can I say? It, this is exactly what you would have expected from the Goldstone-Boson equivalence theorem. It's a somewhat uh, um, subtle application of that theorem because the, you have to use the theorem for the case where there are two energetic Ws which are both have, both have their energy going to infinity. Um, but the proof that's in Chanowitz and Gaillard applies to that case. And indeed, um, using that theorem, you can prove that the answer had to be this after you worked really hard and made all the cancellations. OK, now, once again, we can ask the question, OK, we've done a lot of theorizing. Does nature actually understand uh, what it is that we just said. And very nicely, the total cross-section for E plus E minus to W plus W minus was measured in the LEP program that I described to you in the first lecture. And in fact, the results that you would expect are rather dramatically different. Um, any individual diagram, as we saw, diverges, so M squared goes like 
uh, S. And what that means is that um, an individual diagram squared will eventually go to a constant. When you integrate over the t-channel, it goes to a constant times the logarithm. So any individual diagram, for example, uh, the neutrino exchange diagram, rises dramatically. And in fact, the rise would have been apparent even over the LEP region, uh, which goes up to about 200 GeV. If the diagrams are canceling, you get a totally different behavior, one that basically levels off like that and doesn't have the rise. It only has some logarithmic dependence from integrating over the t-channel exchange. And the difference between these curves is can be a factor of three, even at 200 GeV, which is not so far above the W threshold. And if you look at figure three, you can see what the data says. So um, this is just an amazing thing. Um, if you only include the neutrino diagram, uh, you get the blue curve, which is, as you see, wildly inconsistent with the data. And if you add up the three diagrams, and then there are some small effects because these people include order uh, alpha electroweak corrections, you get a theoretical prediction that just lies directly on the data for the total cross-section. So um, whatever mystery there is in these calculations, nature has no problem with it. Um, nature understands that the Goldstone boson equivalence theorem is exactly what you're supposed to get for this particular process. Okay. Well, now we've seen an example where you do get the enhancement that's apparent in the longitudinal polarization vector. We've seen another example where you don't get the enhancement. And it looks like a miracle, but which relies very much on the very specific values of the Young-Mills coupling of gauge bosons. But nevertheless, the Goldstone boson equivalence theorem told us that that cancellation has to happen. And indeed, when you work it out, it does happen. So now I'd like to talk about one more example of this physics, which is a little more closely related to collider physics, to LHC physics. So as we'll talk tomorrow, one of the mechanisms for producing the Higgs boson at the LHC is to use the fact that the Higgs boson couples to W plus W minus. And you can try to um, produce the Higgs boson from W plus W minus in a process called WW fusion that looks like this. So you have an up quark which radiates a W boson. And just like the gluon, we can think about the W boson at sufficiently high energy as being as having an enhancement when it's radiated in the collinear direction from a quark. So we have a valence quark and one proton that collinearly, approximately collinearly, radiates a W boson and turns into a down quark, which is also more or less collinear with the beam direction. So it would be seen as a, a very energetic forward jet in the event. On the other side, we can take a valence down quark and let it emit a collinear W minus boson turning into an up quark which gives a second very forward, very energetic jet. And then the guys come together because they have a coupling to the Higgs boson and produce a Higgs boson. And what would be especially cool is if these W bosons were longitudinally polarized. If they were longitudinally polarized, then at this vertex, um, these would act like Goldstone bosons. So when we put them together, we would get the enhancement of a gauge coupling up to a Higgs coupling to produce something in the Higgs sector. And you can imagine that this mechanism is more general than just producing the Higgs boson. If there were some new physics in the Higgs sector, uh, we would have some diagram like this, maybe producing new particles or WW scattering or something like that. And it would just be great if the coupling here were the strong coupling to the Higgs sector rather than the relatively weak coupling of a pure gauge particle. So for that, we'd like to be able to collinearly radiate longitudinal W bosons. However, there's a problem that you might imagine, which is that 
at this vertex, if this guy acted like the Goldstone boson, the Goldstone boson coupling to the up and down quarks is um, more or less zero. So it seems, when the second time you think about it, that there's a big enhancement that's possible here, but you're going to get zero for this vertex when you radiate a longitudinally polarized W boson. And so uh, what's the answer? It's not so obvious. We just better do the calculation. So what I'd like to do now is to calculate the uh, splitting functions in the way that I did in the third lecture of this course for a quark radiating W bosons of various polarizations. And we'll just see what the answer looks like. Um, maybe I should just say that it's not totally obvious that you get zero because in the collinear limit, it's like going to the rest frame. And when you go to the rest frame, as you know, a longitudinally polarized W boson just looks like any other W boson and has a gauge coupling type coupling. So let's do the calculation and we'll see what happens and uh, probably we'll be wiser than getting our hands about it. Okay, so I did this kind of computation for you before. So let me just set it up in exactly the same way. Um, K and Q. P is on shell. K is on shell, carrying a momentum fraction one minus Z, let's say. And some transverse momentum. And then the Q, the momentum of the W boson, is off shell. And um, that momentum just has to be whatever it has to be to conserve energy and momentum. Okay. So the first thing we maybe should do is calculate the denominator of the W propagator here. That's uh, Q squared minus MW squared, and it's equal to minus PT squared uh, minus, um, from this term, PT squared Z over 1 minus Z, and then minus MW squared. So what we get then is minus um, Pt squared over 1 minus z plus mw squared. So we're a little farther off shell because we're trying to make a virtual massive boson here. But if Pt is of order mw, it's more or less the same enhancement that we had before when we were radiating collinear gluons. Um, so that's an interesting thing to take into account. Okay. Now, the emission vertex is uh, I g over root 2, u dagger of k, sigma dot q, sigma dot epsilon, u of p. So this is the same thing we looked at on uh, Wednesday morning. Tuesday, Wednesday, yesterday morning, yeah, that's right. Okay, um, the polarization spinners that we need, let me consider left-handed incoming quarks because only the left-handed quarks can radiate a W boson. And then the outgoing quark is also left-handed and its spinner is two times one minus Z times E. Um, Pt over 2 times 1 minus z times e and 1. Okay. The polarization vectors for left and right are um, minus i, and um, because there's some recoil, because the W boson is at an angle, there's a minus Pt over z e here. 
And let's be a little more careful about the longitudinal polarization vector. This is going to be the momentum of the W. The energy of the W is ZE. There's a rotation from this configuration by PT. So there's a PT over MW here. And um, Q here is ZE squared minus MW squared to the one half. Okay. So good. So now um, we can just put these ingredients together and see what we get for the various matrix elements. Well, I think it'll be no surprise to you if I say that there isn't anything special that happens in the transverse case. So in the transverse case, we're going to get exactly the same answer that we got yesterday morning, except that there's a weak coupling instead of a QC, 2E, the square root of 1 minus Z, divided by the square root of 2, PT over Z times 1 minus Z, times uh, 1 for a left-handed W boson and 1 minus Z for a right-handed W boson. For the longitudinal case, we maybe have to work a little. So um, 2E times the square root of 1 minus Z. Um, the spinner is PT over 2 times 1 minus Z times E and 1. Um, the epsilon dot sigma uses this quantity here. So there's a Q minus E up here. Sorry, a Q plus Z E up here. A Q minus Z E down here over MW. And um, a PT over MW here and a PT over MW here. Okay. So now, what are the important terms? Well, there's a 1 here, there's a 1 here. Um, the, uh, we're going to get this term, which I'll calculate for you in a moment. The terms that are um, involve this and this are order PT squared. So they're subdominant. So actually, the only term that's important is the term that comes from this matrix element entry. And Q minus Z E divided by MW. Now, let's remember, Q and E separately have the uh, longitudinal polarization enhancement. But their difference does not. So Q is Z E from the expression over there minus 1 half MW squared over Z E minus ZE divided by MW. So in the end, we get something with MW over 2ZE instead of uh, PT as we got here, we get MW in the numerator. But the approximation that we're making is one which is good when PT is of order MW. So this expression is going to be of order 1 with respect to the other uh, collinear emission amplitudes. So let me now just collect everything and try and get an expression for the cross section. Okay. The emission matrix element is then um, IG over root 2. There's a Sorry, um, excuse me. Sorry, IG times, in the three cases, the square root of 1 minus Z, um, PT over Z times 1 minus Z. So this is what we got before for the left-handed emission. PT over Z times 1 minus Z times 1 minus Z. So that's what we got before for the right-handed emission. And then for the longitudinal emission, uh, 1 over the square root of 2, times instead of PT, there's an MW, and sorry, this uh, 
factor is still here and there's a one over Z. So interestingly, these three amplitudes are all of roughly the same order of magnitude um, in the process that I described. Okay, well now there's just one more step, which is as we did yesterday to square up these things, put them into the expression for the cross section and write this as an expression for the W parton distribution in the proton, or in this case, in the up quark. So let's try and do that. Um, the kind of process that we're interested in here is up to down, a W plus going into some process where let's say X goes in and Y comes out. So let me write the cross section for this reaction. Sigma ux to dy is equal to 1 over 2s, the integral over the outgoing quark, the y phase space, the energy momentum delta function is um, p plus px minus py minus k, the matrix element for uh, u to w, which is just what I computed here for the various w polarization states, the denominator, which I also computed for you, and the matrix element for uh, w plus x going to y. Okay. As we did yesterday, we can look at the kinematics here and take the collinear limit of the kinematics. So we would write this as uh, dz times e times dpt squared times pi divided by 16 pi cubed times k is 1 minus z e. s hat is um, zs, and so there's a z left over, and um, the E's cancel as before, and we get um, D2P PT squared over uh, 4 pi times 4 pi, uh, Z over 1 minus Z, times 1 over 2 S hat, which is what we need to combine with this and this and this to make the cross section for the hard subprocess that we're dealing with here. So then finally, the expression for the cross-section begins to take this form. Um, the integral over z and pt, as we saw in yesterday morning's lecture, um, divided by 4 pi. Um, time, let me write times 4 pi. The, uh, when we put together this factor, this factor, this factor, and that factor, we get the cross-section for wx going to y. And then what's left over is um, the factor here of z over 1 minus z. The denominator, which is 1 minus z squared over pt squared plus 1 minus z and w squared squared. And the matrix element, this matrix element, where I've listed these matrix elements over here. So at this point, everything should be looking very familiar. This is more or less the same computation that we did in the previous lecture. And so let's now just note what the results look like. So let's first consider only the transverse polarization. Then we get the g, g squared and 4 pi is going to give us an alpha weak. So we'll end up with um, sigma ux to dy is um, 
the integral dz, the integral dpt squared, the factor pt squared here, and the dmw squared. There's an alpha weak. There is um, a 4 pi rather than a 2 pi because there's an extra square root of 2 in these expressions. And then if you square up these things, you find, as we found yesterday, 1 minus z squared over z, the usual uh, alteroi parisi splitting function for a fermion to go to a vector boson and a fermion times the sigma of wx going to y. So very interestingly, what we find is that there's a part-time distribution of the W boson in the up quark. And if you convolve that with the up quark parton distribution, there's a parton distribution to find W partons in the photon, in the proton. And we've computed the structure here. Please notice that this integral here is still logarithmically divergent. PT squared, PT squared over PT to the fourth. So the structure is exactly the same as what we found uh, yesterday morning. Um, the parton distribution of the W in the up quark is alpha W uh, now um, please excuse me uh, 1 plus 1 minus z squared over z so the same alterally Parisi splitting function that we found before. And then from this integral, there's a logarithm of q squared over mw squared, where because of this term, the w mass now cuts it off in the infrared. Nevertheless, for very high energy, there's an enhancement here. And for example, at a 100 TeV collider that some of you might be thinking about for your far future, um, there are going to be lots of w partons in the proton that we can use to uh, actually collide with one another and study the Higgs sector way up at very high energies. Now, what about the longitudinal component? Well, there, um, we have to just change what needs to be changed. So we're going to find uh, the integral dz, the integral b dpt squared, but now instead of the pt, there's an mw squared. And then collecting the other factors, we find alpha w, there's another factor of 2, so there's an 8 pi. Um, 1 minus z squared, because that's not in the denominator here, and a uh, 1 over z when the smoke clears. So for the transverse w, we find this expression. For the longitudinal w, what we find is an expression alpha w over, over 8 pi. The structure is... Uh, 1 minus z squared over z. And then there's a pt integral which is now a finite integral as pt goes to infinity. So roughly as a function of pt, the longitudinal w's are very close to our very close to a value pt of order mw, whereas the transverse w's are spread out with a logarithmic dependence over a much larger region. Okay. And um, because this is a finite integral, we might as well just do the integral. And we get alpha weak over 8 pi, uh, 1 minus z over z, which now is a very compact expression for the probability of, in a valence quark in the proton, finding a longitudinal W. 
It doesn't have the same Q squared enhancement as this one, but interestingly, it's an order one number. And so, again, when you go up to your 100 TeV collider, there'll be even lots of uh, Higgs particles in the proton, or if not the Higgs particles, at least the Goldstone boson components of the Higgs multiplet that will be able to collide together at very high energy. Maybe I should say this result was first derived by Sally Dawson. So, um, well, I hope this lecture has been quite interesting. Uh, we picked up what seemed at first to be a somewhat obscure aspect of the polarization vector of massive vector bosons, but it turned out that there was really a lot of physics in it. In various places, we got enhancements of cross-sections. In other places, we got bizarre cancellations, which are required by this theorem. Everything is regulated by the physics of gauge theories. And there's this interesting suggestion that I've just traced out here that we'll be able to do interesting experiments with the Higgs sector using ordinary W bosons radiated from quarks and indeed viewable as partons of the proton at very high energy. Okay, so that's what I prepared for today, so thank you very much. Okay, questions, please. Yes. Um, questions don't have to be on this lecture. I'm sure I left a lot of questions along the way through the week. Please. No, my, my question is on the result because the calculation that you asked. Yes. Physical of considering the three polarizations as different processes. Oh. I would con consider the three of them a cross section, but I don't see how it should be different. Oh, uh, so there is indeed some interference between these processes which you should take into account. Maybe I should just say that the approximations I'm using here, which are called the effective W approximation, um, because at the LHC it's hard to get the W many um, to a momentum which is many times higher than the W mass. They're not so accurate. This kind of theory is good to about the 10% level. Nevertheless, I think it's very illustrative. But the polarization carried by the W does have a consequence. So if I think about an on-shell W reacting against something and producing some final state, for example, um, W gluon scattering, making a heavy quark pair, a top quark, TB bar, let's say. Okay, maybe you want to compute the total cross-section and just sum inclusively over everything here. But if you're more particular about where things are going, what the angular distributions are, you don't have precise overlap between the consequence of having a left-handed or right-handed or a longitudinally polarized W. And it is actually interesting to think about these as separate processes that are added to one another. Now for the really interesting case where you're looking at reactions of the Higgs sector, um, there the situation is different because in the Higgs sector it might be that, okay, so now I have some uh, strongly coupled constituent of the Higgs boson, the W transverse coupling is of order G, but the longitudinal W coupling is of some larger number, which is the coupling within the Higgs sector to these Higgs components. And so in that case, this kind of an amplitude can completely dominate. And you can just forget about that one to a first approximation. Now actually, this happens when you have, if the Higgs boson had a very heavy mass, like 300 GeV, or if there exists a 300 GeV Higgs boson which mixes with the known Higgs boson, um, this would actually be true. The WW fusion to that heavy Higgs would be completely dominated by the longitudinal polarization. 
and the transverse polarization would just be negligible. So um, it, it's actually interesting to see whether that component is there. Other questions? Please. Uh, you say that a more powerful hadronic collider will be quite useful for uh, future Higgs searches, right? But I don't quite see from where the advantage of the hadrons come, because this f splitting function seems to me just the same as it would be with leptons. Absolutely. So the same can be said about the leptonic collider. Absolutely. And in fact, if you would arrange to build for me a TEV lepton collider, um, you would have more or less the same story. So right now, you know, really it's the question of where the technologies are. Um, I think we have on the table, I'll talk a little more about this tomorrow, a proposal for a 1 TeV center of mass E plus E minus collider called the International Linear Collider. And actually part of the program of that collider is to do these WW scattering experiments using a formalism like what I described here. On the other hand, um, people are at CERN are now debating building a 100-kilometer ring and having a 100 TeV PP collider. And in that case, you would have up quarks and down quarks that uh, instead of having a 1 TeV center of mass energy, maybe they'll have a 10 to 30 TeV center of mass energy with some probability. And then you'll get to higher energy in these Ws that you can collide with one another. And um, I think eventually the E plus E minus guys will get there too. But, uh, you know, the time scale, time scales in high energy physics are, are vast, right? The International Linear Collider will be running, if we're lucky, in the late 2020s, the 100 TeV Collider in the late 2040s. Um, you folks are all young enough that you'll be very active in the late, in the mid 2040s. And you can look forward to these high energy proton proton colliders. Maybe in the 2040s, we'll also have a 20 TeV plus E minus collider, and we'll be able to learn all kinds of fascinating things. But these high energies of hadronic interactions imply high multiplicities of reactions. Yes. So it's, it seems to be m much more difficult technically to just to register all the data. Oh, absolutely. But you do what you have to do to learn something in physics, right? Other questions? Please, way up in the back of the room. You said that this description of the w <coughs> double double uh, double W decay in Nix, uh, it's not accurate, and this is why it's, this is because uh, the we we have the assumption that uh, pt is uh, uh, of the order of the mass of w or it's uh, for other that's reasons. right so so the approximation that was used in this last part of the lecture is that pt is of order mw and much greater than the energy of the incoming quark okay okay so if you have a 6 TeV proton, and you're at x equals 0.1, then you have a 600 GeV quark. And what we would need is that Pt is of order 100 GeV. So it's not, you know, it, it's a good approximation, but it's not a perfect approximation. Oh, it, it's now, a, maybe I should also say... It's a like of collinear approximation of the W. Right. So maybe I should also say that in just like W fusion, it's really um, not very hard to just completely compute this diagram. And it's made easier by these things called spinner product methods, which are explained in the uh, um, set of lecture notes that I referred you to um, on the first, in the first lecture. So it, you know, the technic techniques of calculation are such that you can just compute this diagram exactly. You don't need any approximation. And However, um, I think Looking at it in terms of the effective W approximation is very useful to get an intuition for how it works. 
And that's really why I went through this exercise. And you you start from a U U U D decay and what flavor cha use. So for example to create the W from a B top or or other or other coupling with the leptons. So um well it's really whatever you wish. I used U D just because those are the valence uh quarks in the proton. So those are the ones likely to be at the very high energies that you would want to be at to run this process. But yes, when you actually do the computation, you should sum over all species, all up species on one side and all down species on the other. Possible to prove that the other contributions are small compared with the UD contribution? They're, they're only smaller because the quarks and antiquarks, antiquarks can also come in here, are typically at lower X. And so they can't produce so energetic a W boson. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Okay, more questions in question time, so I'll see you then.